a look through this prism may just want to make you go out of the water. You know, sharks get a bad rap. They're not the monsters often depicted in the movies, but they are an animal that still gets our attention, at least if Shark Week's ratings are to be believed. Now, there's come to light something new from the great depths. They've named it the Carolina Hammerhead. Here to describe this new denizen of the deep is the man who discovered it, University of South Carolina ichthyologist Joe Quattro. Welcome, Dr. Quattro. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, it's my understanding that when this began, you weren't casting your net, so to speak, for sharks. In fact, you weren't even studying saltwater marine life. What happened? You know, I started off life studying freshwater fish, and we had been looking at how different genetically fish populations were in South Carolina, South Carolina river systems. We started up in the mountains and slowly moved our way down, um, down in the coastal plain. Started finding that most fish populations were pretty distinct between river systems. And we got interested, well, what happens to, for example, fish species that run up rivers to spawn but spend most of their time in estuaries? We started doing short-nosed sturgeons, for example. They were distinct between river systems. So then we thought, well, what's the, how do we move further out from an estuarine-type animal? And sharks were the most obvious choice. Um, South Carolina the, has really nice estuaries, a series of estuaries. And they're very well-known what are called pupping grounds for sharks. In other words, mom moves into the fringes of the estuary. She gives birth to the young. The young swim in, stay in the estuaries for a year or so. And then they move out and join the adult population. So it was just, to us, the most obvious next step to look at differentiation between rivers. So why is this such a good area for sharks? Is it that the rivers, the ecosystem in South Carolina are particularly healthy or just rife with a lot of different munchables? You know, I'm, I'm sure part of it is because it's good environments. The university has a field lab, the Brook Field Lab in Georgetown. It represents one of the more pristine estuarine systems left on the East Coast. So certainly environmental quality plays a role. I would imagine also, to, to a certain extent, you're talking about a fairly stable environmental regime. You know, we're south of Hatteras. The water's warm, stays warm, you know, for quite some time. So it's very productive. Productive environments for a lot of different species of fish, not just sharks, but a lot of game fish, for example, tarpons and so on. A lot of their young use estuarine systems as nursery ground. The flip side of that is estuaries are generally fairly harsh. So in the summertime, there's a lot of energy, but they're very harsh environments. Um, very hot, they get very hot. The salinities change dramatically and so on. So estuaries generally don't have a lot of fish that stay there all year round. Good nursery areas, a lot of energy, but you know, primarily um, those particular species are going to leave when times get tough. Now, in your previous answer, you mentioned the word distinct several times, and I just have to wonder how we're defining that, because someone might wonder, well, you found a new shark. Is this just a variation in the genome of one specific shark that we all know about, or is it really a new species of shark? Um, so when I say distinct, I mean distinct in a genetic sense, and, but also, too, I mean, we use various sort of buzzwords or operational words for how we define, for example, management units. So if I want to manage a fishery and that particular species occurs in all four river systems in South Carolina, one question I can ask is how different are those different populations in di those uh, different river systems? A consequence of that would be, for example, if for some unknown reason, the Santee River in South Carolina got wiped out. How long would it take for individuals, the same species, from other river systems to recolonize that river? Uh, and so now we're talking about time. How long is that going to take? When I say distinct for South Carolina rivers, it depends on the species that you're looking at. But for some species, it probably will never occur. Or it's going to occur on time scales that are so large that it's obviously not ecological time, time within our lifetimes that's going to occur. It's going to be hundreds of thousands or millions of years before something like that occurs. So I'm talking about fairly large um, differentiation when I say distinct.
And when you're talking about that large differentiation, is it a differentiation, especially in regards to this hammerhead, that we could see with our eye, or is this something we would only see under the microscope? Well, for the uh, Carolina hammerhead, when we were first working on this, um, I had a student who was collecting sharks. He was doing his dissertation on black tip sharks. And I asked him why he was down there, you know, what do you catch commonly uh, when you're out capturing uh, black tips? And he said, we get a lot of small hammerheads. And I said, okay, that's great. Can you bring back tissues from the small hammerheads? Um, again, so we could get an idea of genetic differentiation between hammerheads, small hammerheads, in different estuarine systems in South Carolina. We started doing some genetic work on them, and all of a sudden we started finding two very different things. So he said, well, morphologically, these are scalloped hammerheads. And I said, well, genetically, they're two very different things within this group of animals that you're calling scalloped hammerheads. Then there was sort of this mad rush to uh, find specimens of all other known hammerheads because perhaps we had just misidentified, morphologically misidentified something. We did, some gene- again, some genetic work on those, found that the, this different thing we were finding that looked like a scalloped hammerhead was actually something that hadn't been seen. And that's when we first got on then to this idea that probably what we were dealing with is what's called a cryptic species. Cryptic just seem, basically implies that morphologically they are indistinguishable from something else. So. The Carolina hammerhead is morphologically indistinguishable from a scalloped hammerhead. Genetically, they are very different. Later on, we did some x-rays on the vertebral column on some specimens of Carolina hammerheads and scalloped hammerheads. It turns out vertebral counts in sharks um, are fairly diagnostic for species. So in other words, the counts of the number of vertebra, total number of vertebra in the vertebral column is a very good characteristic to differentiate very closely related species of sharks. We had a local vet who uh, x-rayed a bunch of specimens for us, and it turns out that this odd genetic thing, the Carolina hammerhead, which was genetically distinct from scalloped hammerheads, also had 10 fewer vertebra than scalloped hammerheads. So now we had genetic data and we had morphological data, which is the vertebral counts, saying that this thing was, in fact, um, distinct. And therefore, you could say that it wasn't just a mutation or an aberration amongst the species, but that it was a separate animal itself. Yeah, because, you know, this isn't just one individual out of, you know, a thousand scalloped hammerheads. We, We have studied over 100 individuals of these. In the paper, we describe 80 and if I remember correctly, I think 54 of those were Carolina hammerheads. So we're talking about 54 Carolina hammerheads, 36 um, scalloped hammerheads. Genetically, that 56 was different from um, the 34. And for vertebral counts, all 56 Carolina hammerheads had 10 fewer vertebra than the 36 scalloped hammerheads. And if I were to ask you to paint an audio picture of what these sharks look like, could you help our listeners visualize it? Um, you know, you're really asking the wrong person. <laughs> I am so horribly colorblind. Um, that, well, well, they're how many, so how many feet long? Well, the things that we have been looking at, the specimens that we have examined, are generally somewhere between about 12 to maybe 16 inches long. Remember, these are pups. These are, year, quote, yearlings. Um, individuals that are fairly young. So we, we actually have never seen an adult of these. The hmm. description itself is based on juveniles. Um, you can imagine it's difficult if morphologically, based on external characteristics, you can't tell the difference between a scalloped hammerhead and a Carolina hammerhead, asking someone to save you 100 or 200 six-foot adults hammerhead sharks so you can see whether or not you have an adult is a very difficult um, endeavor. So unfortunately right now, no, we've never seen an adult. This is all based on juvenile individuals. So were you um, 
with some of these juveniles? Have you tagged them so that you can track them later on in life? No, we have not. I mean, we've thought about doing that, but again, the problem is morphologically, I can't tell the difference between them. So if we were going to go down and tag them, so one, one thing we could do is tag a bunch of individuals, um, take a piece of tissue, do some genetics, and say, okay, these tags were this, were Carolina hammerheads, and this group were scalloped hammerheads. The problem with that is you'd be tagging 